My name is Tim Westcott, and I am going to show you how to tune a PID controller. The tuning method that I'm going to show you in this video is a good seat-of-the-pants tuning method to use for tuning a PID controller. It is very easy on the math, and it gives you a simple, direct recipe that tells you how to tune a PID controller. It is almost the industry standard way of tuning a PID controller if you are not educated in formal control theory. And it's also a nice way to tune a PID controller if you have a system where you want to take extensive measurements on it and do the job the more formal way, but you have to have the system working before you can take the measurements to characterize how it works. Now, this tuning method comes with a few caveats that you need to know before you decide to use it. The first is that it is an informal tuning method. And unless you do extensive simulation of your system before you go and cut metal, you cannot know ahead of time whether or not what you're building is going to work. You either have to build your physical plant and just take a leap of faith that it's going to work after it's tuned, or you have to be building something that's similar to something that you've built before and kind of know by similarity that, well, the last thing worked, so this next thing is going to work. The second caveat with this is that you are almost guaranteed to not get the optimal tuning using this method. And in fact, if you're trying to tune for high speed, the harder that you push to get the thing faster, the more you're going to run into the third caveat. And the third caveat is that using this tuning method, you really don't know how close to building an unstable system you are. Now, there are some safeguards built into the method to kind of make sure that what you're building is stable. But when you use this method, you do run a greater risk than you would with using a more formal method. You run a, more, a greater risk of having a system that is stable in the lab, but is not necessarily stable in production, particularly if you want to build one system in the lab and then use that as a pattern to build hundreds or thousands of systems for production. So bear that in mind when you're using this method. The idea behind this tuning method is that high gains lead to high performance, except if you push them too hard, they lead to instability. So what you want to do is for each of the derivative, proportional, and integral gains is to find the highest reasonable gain that gives you good performance and does not make the system go unstable. So what you do is you turn, tune each of these in turn, and then when you're done finding the best gain for each one of these, then you stop. Now, there are a couple of more things to note. First, some differences out there in PID nomenclature. So I'll explain what nomenclature I use for my PID controllers. And second, I'll be explaining a concept called derivative band limiting because it's used in this system. So the PID nomenclature that I use is I separate out the integral gain and the proportional gain and the derivative gain each individually. Now there are other PID designers who use a system where they have a master gain and they have what they call a reset time, which is basically the proportional of the integral gain to the master gain. And then they have a derivative time, which is basically the proportional of the derivative gain to the master gain. Um, the other thing that some people like to do is they like to express their gains in real world units, in seconds or in you know volts per second or volts per hertz or whatever. Um, I prefer to just use the raw numbers that are in the software. That's probably more of a quirk than anything else, but I do find that it kind of keeps me honest because it makes me pay attention to what my sampling rate is. And when you get farther along in this, you do not want to forget that you're working with a sample time system. I actually struggled a little bit 
in designing this video and deciding whether or not I was going to include a discussion of the derivative band limit at all. And I decided in the end that it just makes more sense to put it in. So even though this is kind of a hand-waving, touchy-feely explanation, I still want to let you know what it is because it's necessary for the tuning of this particular device. The derivative band limit essentially, instead of using just a raw derivative term, it averages the derivative term over the derivative settling time. And the longer that you set the settling time, basically the tighter you're setting the band limit. They're inversely proportional. And the more the derivative term is averaged out, which actually means that it acts less and less like a derivative. When you average it a whole bunch, it starts acting more like a proportional term than a derivative term. But this system happens to be noisy, and the derivative term tends to amplify noise. So we have to control that while at the same time getting some useful derivative action out of this thing. And so you'll see when I'm tuning, I'll show you that trade-off. Now the derivative band limit that I show in this system is adjusted with a parameter called ADD. And if you happen to know enough control theory to know what the Z domain is, that ADD is the Z domain pole position of the derivative action. If you don't know control theory and what I just said doesn't make any sense, then just ignore those last few seconds of this video. Now, the actual derivative settling time is roughly equal to 1 over the sampling rate of this system times the quantity 1 minus that ADD term. And the sampling rate on this system is equal to 1 kilohertz. So later on when you see a set ADD, then you can kind of figure out what the derivative time is. Or what we'll, we'll do it the other way. We'll decide on a derivative settling time. And then from that, we'll calculate a starting value of ADD. Now we're going to be doing this tuning in a specific order. First, we're going to set the derivative band limit. Then we're going to find a value of the derivative gain that we're happy with. Now at that point, you can do one of two things. You can either say that you're overall happy with derivative action, or you can go back and you can experiment with a derivative band limit. And I'll show you on this system how changing the derivative band limit affects how it operates. And we'll end up finding a compromise between the derivative band limit and the derivative gain. Then after you've settled on that, then you find a proportional gain that works with the derivative gain. They interact. It turns out how you set the derivative gain affects how high you can set the proportional gain. So you find a proportional gain that goes with the derivative gain that you found. And then when you're happy with that proportional gain, then you find an integral gain that goes with the proportional gain. And then you do the most important thing of all, which is you stop. You don't go back and dink with the proportional gain or the derivative gain. You don't go through over and over again partially trying to do this. Now you might find that you're not satisfied with how the thing behaves, in which case you want to go all the way back either to choosing that derivative band limit or to choosing the derivative gain and then sweep through the tuning again. But what you don't want to do is settle on the integral gain and then go back and tweak the proportional gain and then go back and tweak the derivative gain. Because if you do that, then chances are you will be building a system that is just hovering on the verge of instability, waiting for your back to be turned so that it can burst into song and make you look like a fool in front of customers or management or, or whoever. So that's the order of operations that we'll be using as we tune this system. Now as a general rule of thumb with derivative band limit, you don't want to borrow trouble. If you can get away with a system that doesn't use it, then don't use it. As a matter of fact, if you have a pretty good idea that you're not going to need it, you may not want to build it into your code at all. If your system shows excessive noise, or if you try to get it tuned up and you see an oscillation 
at one half the sampling rate or at some small fraction of the sampling rate, then you want to use derivative band limiting. So we'll explain how derivative band limiting works. So the way to find the preliminary value for that derivative band limiting is to first decide how quickly you want the system to settle out and then from that decide the derivative settling time and then from that figure calculate whatever your derivative band limiting parameter is. And now in my system situation this is a this is a control system trainer I can decide anything I want for settling time. So I'm kind of arbitrarily deciding that I want it to settle out in a tenth of a second. Okay, so I want it to settle out in a tenth of a second. And that means that I want a derivative settling time equal to about one one hundredth of a second. My sampling rate is one kilohertz. So if I do the math on my equation for that ADD parameter, I find out that I want ADD equal to 0 0.9. So, let's set that. It happens that ADD is already set to 0 0.9 in this case. There. Okay, now we're almost ready to tune. If your system will work with both proportional and integral gains set to zero, then set them to zero. Or if you have a pretty good idea of an initial tuning, you might want to start there. However, you want to have that tuning backed off. So you want to have the integral gains and the proportional gains set fairly low, even though the system will respond sluggishly because you don't want them getting in the way of finding the right value for the differential gain. Now, in the case of this system, I have a different way of disabling the integral and the proportional ac action, and I do that by setting some limits to zero. So I'll, I'll do that right now. There goes the integrator limit, and there goes what I call a velocity limit, which in this system is basically the proportional limit. And so now I'm ready to start tuning this system. Okay, now let's set the derivative gain. Now to set the derivative gain, what you do is you make sure that the system is stable as a starting point, and then you start increasing the derivative gain step by step until you observe the system either outright going unstable or starting to misbehave. And then when you find that point where it's not behaving correctly, then you cut the gain by a factor of two and you stop. So let's turn this on and see what we can see. Now, right now the only action that's going in this is the derivative action. So it just goes and it stays where I put it because it's balanced and because there's no proportional gain or integral gain trying to pull it to some specific spot. And currently the derivative gain is set to a thousand. So we know it's stable. It's settling out nicely. So let's try a higher gain. I'm going to say this is still nice. You can see that it overshoots just a little bit, but it's really not that bad. Let's try a higher gain yet. Okay, so now you can see it's different in one direction than the other. But here it overshoots a little bit. And going the other direction, it actually overshoots a couple of times. I'm going to try a higher gain yet. It's at 5,000 now. We'll try it at 10,000. Okay. So it's not going to behave much differently, but this is not good behavior that you want in a system. So in a normal system, we would bring this gain down to below 
where it started misbehaving. So it really started misbehaving at 5,000. I'm going to bring it down to 2,000 again. Now this is the point in our sequence. We've set the derivative band limit and we've set the derivative gain, but we might want to go back and experiment with derivative band limit again. Now, I happen to know for this system that it likes the derivative band limit as it's set. Um, as a matter of fact, you can see that the, the propeller is spinning just a little bit. And I'm not sure if it comes through on the audio, but you can hear that it's hesitating a little bit. It's, it's kind of jiggering and going back and forth. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to turn the derivative band limit off and watch what happens. Okay, and now it's not only does it have this funny jittering to it, but it's got a distinct bias, and I honestly don't know where the bias is coming from but I know that it, it's not happy. And if I, if I increase the derivative gain, you see, it's not, it's behaving better. It's not doing that overshoot thing that it was doing, except that it has this this bias to the um, it has this bias to the speed. So I'm going to turn the derivative gain up even higher yet. And you see, I'm going to turn that off. That was just too loud. Um, so what you were seeing there is that the actual derivative action itself was working better with the derivative band limiting turned off, but all of these bad behaviors from having derivative band limiting turned off came into the fore. So I'm gonna turn my derivative band limiting back to where it was and turn my derivative gain back. And now, now we have our derivative gain set, and I'm just gonna leave the derivative band limit where it is right now, and we'll move on to doing the proportional gain. Now, we're gonna set the proportional gain. A good starting point for setting proportional gain is either what you already know is going to be a good starting point, or if you can't think of anything, just, just pick something that's 1% of the derivative gain. It, it'll be close. It'll either be a little too high and you can start bringing it down or it'll be low and you can push it up and see what happens. Now in this case I need to enable proportional action so I'll do that now. And you see it immediately starts moving. And then I'll check the proportional gain, and it turns out that the proportional gain is already set to 1% of my derivative gain, because my derivative gain was 2,000, proportional gain is 2. So let's see how this thing behaves. This is pretty good behavior from a stability standpoint, but we might want it to respond a little more promptly. So let's try increasing the proportional gain. We'll try a gain of five. See, now it's stopping very smartly. So this is how it behaves with a proportional gain of five and a derivative gain of 2,000. Let's increase the proportional gain and see what happens.
Now you see there, it, it kind of oscillated around before it got to the target point. And it did the same thing in the other direction, only worse. Now, normally, I would stop here. I would say, okay, this is my gain where it's misbehaving. We'll back the gain off. So I'd back the gain off to 5. But I want to show you what happens. So let's, let's increase the gain up to 20 and see what happens. See, in here, what's, what's happening is it's trying to stop nice and quickly, but instead it's just going into this oscillation. So we'll drop that gain down to 5. Okay. So we like this. We have our derivative gain set to 2000. We have the proportional gain set to 5. And now it's time to set the integral gain. So we've set our derivative and our proportional gain. Now let's set our integrator gain. Now first we want to start by enabling the integrator action. And we'll do that. Okay, and then we'll start, I'm going to start by seeing what we have for integrator gain there. And we have an integrator gain of 0 0.002, which must be a good starting point because it's working okay. Now, you could, if you had no clue of what to set the integrator gain to, just figure out what the proportion is between the derivative gain and the proportional gain. And in this case, that's, that's 2,000 to 5, or about 400 to 1. And then go down by that same amount to come up with a starting figure for the integrator gain, which, as you can see, we're starting our integrator gain somewhat lower than that. So let's start pushing this up and see what happens. I'm going to go ahead, instead of just bumping it up by a factor of 2 each time, I'm going to jump up by a factor of 5 just to see what happens. Okay, so we're seeing a little bit of overshoot here. But it's, it's shooting over. It, it, it's not too bad. I'm going to increase this a bit more and see what happens. Okay, I wasn't sure because I jumped up so much what I was seeing. And so, but I went up by a factor of two, and now it's, it's definitely in a damped oscillation here. So it's misbehaving at an integrator gain of 0 0.02. And knowing that this is misbehaving, then we can kind of see that, okay, this is misbehaving also. So we'll drop that down by another factor of two. Okay, and here we do have some overshoot, but it only overshoots once, and then it comes back. And there's kind of a fine line between what's oscillation and what's just a normal overshoot. And I'm going to call this a normal overshoot. Um, now, part of the reason this is overshooting at this point is because of something called integrator windup, which I am not going to get into in this video, but I will explain integrator and other state windups in a later video. So, for right now, we've got the derivative gain set, we've got the derivative band limit set, we've got the proportional gain set, and I'm just going to declare that we have the integrator gain set. So, at this point, we need to do the very most important part of tuning this PID controller. We need to resist temptation, we need to stop, we need to call it good. And that's what I'm going to do. Now we've just done the most important part, and to some extent the hardest thing to do with this tuning method, which is to stop. The reason that we can't really tweak and tune this thing as we might be tempted to do is because, because it is an informal tuning method, it doesn't give us the tools to push the performance while ensuring that the thing is safe. So, 
the thing to do is we stop, we test the performance. If it works well enough, great, we're done. If it doesn't work well enough, then you need to use more advanced method of either designing the control system or tuning the control system. Or it might be that you need to change the physical plant of the thing in order to get better performance out of it. In this case, I know that, that there's a considerable amount of noise in there and if higher response speed were really important, the first thing I would need to do is to reduce that noise so that I could increase the derivative bandwidth and then I can build a much faster system. So the important thing is, is that we've stopped. Now, stay tuned for future videos. I will be showing you how to code a PID controller. I will be showing you this integrator and state windup stuff. And moving on in subsequent videos, I'll get into how to do formal control system design so that you won't have to use seat of the pants methods, but rather so that you can use formal, accepted, successful methods for designing your control systems to get the most you can out of the hardware. And if you find that the most that you can get out of the hardware isn't enough, then these formal techniques can help to direct you to the best and least expensive ways that you can modify the hardware so that it will, in fact, deliver the performance that you need. So, until next time, stay tuned.